Africa. He has worked in the southeastern U.S. and neotropical fire-dependent ecosystems for more than 25 years. He is an adjunct faculty member of the University of Georgia's Odom School of Ecology and Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And you can also see Joe O'Brien in action on YouTube if you search for untamed science and why fire is good. So, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thanks. So, thanks a lot. Yeah, sure thanks for the intro. Yeah, so I will hand you the floor in just a second. Okay. Um, and, and again, for folks, that are, uh, for folks that are just joining us, you can type questions into the chat box, and we will address them at the end. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much for the intro, and uh, thanks, everybody, for, for logging in. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a concept that was co-developed between uh, a couple of my colleagues, uh, especially uh, Dr. Bob Mitchell, who was a scientist at the uh, uh, Jones Center, the uh, Jones Center for Ecological Research, uh, who passed away a few years, but was a huge influence on my thinking and a great mentor. And also Kevin Hires, a current colleague of mine. And, um, you know, when we began looking at fire behavior, fire effects, we realized that um, some of the overarching concepts that were, were kind of embedded in the fire community were not really helping move our understanding of mechanisms of, of fire dynamics within fire dependent ecosystems. So we put our heads together, we came up with this concept of the ecology of fuels and we developed it in the con context of southern ecosystems, uh, specifically longleaf pine, slash pine, some pine oak forests and, and the Piedmont. Um, so while it, we developed sort of our concepts in this landscape down here, I'm in Athens, Georgia right now, um, we believe we've identified some sort of broader scale patterns and processes that are, are applicable with a little tweaking to whatever ecosystem that you happen to be uh, working in. So we'll see if I can convince you of that today. So I like to think of, instead of a fire triangle, I like to, to think of the, the fire stool, which doesn't sound great, but uh, you know, fire requires oxygen, fuel, and an ignition source to sustain the chemical chain reaction that is fire itself. So, uh, you know, if you pull away any one of those legs, the, the stool tips over and the fire goes out. So we, we all understand that that's a really basic concept. Um, but it seems like in much of our work, and especially in the operations world, we tend to overgeneralize fuels and we treat them as fuel beds. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but one of the primary reasons is one of the main tools that was and is still used for predicting fire behavior has a fundamental requirement that, that the fuels in the model are treated as homogeneously, uh, homogeneous and spatially uniform. And there's some other uh, assumptions that go into BEHAVE and Rothermel's equations that I think have sort of captured uh, this sort of stand level or even landscape level model of a fuel bed. And, you know, we've done a lot of work tweaking these, these concepts and creating fuel models. The original 13 fuel models that used to feed into BEHAVE have now been expanded to 40, and there's also custom fuel beds that you can create, uh, FCCS and all that. And, and while they have heterogene heterogeneity built into their construction in terms of the components of the fuel bed, they still assume that those fuels are uniform at the, at least the stand level. And that has not helped us answer some fundamental questions of both fire behavior and fire effects, which is what we've been trying to delve into down here to both push the science ahead and also make some management relevant discoveries and, and tools, make some new tools available that will help uh, manage these fire dependent ecosystems. So what do I mean by fundamental questions? Well, depending on, on your system, uh, there is a there's a there's a connection between fuel heterogeneity and fire behavior, and that has to do a lot with both the spatial arrangement of the fuels, but also this concept of fire atmosphere coupling, where differences in the mosaic of fuels within a within a stand can actually drive fire behavior through influencing this sort of fire atmosphere coupling. I'm not going to talk about that today. That's a, a area of research we're actively pursuing that has big implications for explaining fire behavior at, at multiple scales. And there could be these things called emergent properties where some of these uh, synergies that occur between fuels and the atmosphere create larger scale uh, 
processes like plume cores and, and larger fires that it would almost be impossible to predict or, or capture these phenomena without understanding the relationship between the fuel variability and the fire behavior. And I'm an ecologist, so one of the key uh, fundamental questions that exists for us and everywhere actually is, is when you have fire dependent ecosystems that have high diversity, we know that fire frequency and diversity are, are intimately linked. And in fact, in Longleaf, there's almost a linear relationship between high fire frequency and high diversity. But we have no idea what the mechanism driving that relationship is. It's a fundamental mechanism that remains elusive. And from our work, in which I'm going to focus on today, we're showing that heterogeneity in fuels within the stand affects fire energy re release, which is the mechanism that can then drive community assembly, and that also ties into forest regeneration. So that's sort of, I'm going to focus on more of the fire effects part of, of the concept of the ecology of fuels. So what is the ecology of fuels? It's a grand sounding concept, but really it's just getting, getting around sort of compartmentalizing fuels and fire and starting to think about fuels as, a, as an integral between the forest structure, the fire behavior, and then the fire effects. So it's a bridge between both fire behavior, forest structure, and fire effects. So it's this concept that the fuels are this link. And I think I gotta go to number two now. Yeah, okay, so when, when we originally started kicking around this idea of ecology of fuels, there was a really, um, kind of a seminal paper written in the 1970s uh, that was paraphrased in Johnson and Mianishi's book chapter on, on fire. Um, but it was, they talked about the two solitudes of fire science. And for our Canadian friends, there was a book written in the 1950s called The Two Solitudes of, of Canada, basically. And it had to do with the language gap between the Francophones and, and the English speakers. So there, this Canadian Forest Service scientist back in the, in the 1970s made the analogy that the same thing was occurring with fire. So you have the physicists and the engineers speaking their language and they're interested in fire energy release and processes involved with combustion. You have the ecologists and the foresters, they speak their own language, they're interested more in fire effects. Um, and so they're working in these two isolated worlds and they weren't communicating with each other. And so we thought that fuels would be kind of the common ground. You know, the physicists and engineers are interested in fuels because they're what's driving combustion. And the ecologists and foresters are interested in fuels because it's what they work with. It's plants, basically. So that was sort of the beginning. And it was more geared towards fire science and less geared, toward, geared towards management. So how can we use fuels to bridge these two worlds? The engineers and physicists are interested in that, just that moment of combustion and, and the ecologists and the foresters are interested not only in that one hour period when the woods is on fire, but the thousand days that, uh, you know, where the fuels build up and the plants recover, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was, that was the beginning of our, our journey into the ecology of fuels. To bring it to a manager relevant context, it actually, fuels can act as a bridge between ecologists and foresters, which are normally arch enemies and like natural enemies, right? I'm just kidding, because I'm both. But uh, fuels can actually, because of their link with biological diversity in terms of what happens after the fire, and foresters can manipulate forest structure, which then can influence uh, fuel distribution, there's this natural link that you know, it can act as, as common ground between ecologists and foresters as well. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's, that's the, the, the background for uh, the ecology of fuels. And this link between surface fuels and canopy fuels is really fundamental in the systems I work in. It may or may not be as fundamental in your systems, but we can discuss ways that they, 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 might, they might be relevant in the Northeast. So in a nutshell, what is the ecology of fuels? Fuels are derived from plants, plant tissue. The structure of the plant communi com community or the forest is what's going to determine the distribution of those fuels across the landscape. Fuels are a really major driver of fire behavior. They're not the only driver. I recognize that. There's terrain and there's weather. 
but fuels, the, the consumables are really critical for, for understanding fire behavior. And of course, fire behavior, the energy released during fire behavior is then what's going to feed back into the plant community dynamics and determine the structure of the forest post-fire. And so that is sort of the full circle of the ecology of fuels. Another topic that applies is very relevant in our, in our area and may or may not be as relevant where you are, but um, you know, the field of, e of fire ecology has, has not advanced as rapidly and as sort of fundamentally as many other fields in ecology. And part of that, I think, there's a, there's a couple of reasons why I think that's true, but part of the reason was there's always been this real focus on, on sort of larger scale heterogeneity and, and green versus black, unburned versus burned. And that is relevant at landscape scales, but it's difficult to start understanding really detailed mechanistic explanations for forest dynamics when you're way out uh, looking down from a satellite or an airplane. Uh, you know, when, it, when push comes to shove, forest dynamics are, are driven at, 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 by processes that are happening at the individual organism scale. So this focus on just correlating patterns to various other independent variables doesn't really get to some of the mechanisms that might explain, you know, how fire adapted communities actually function. So, and, and I'm not saying this, this pattern of green versus black is not important. It's, it's clearly important, but uh, in the systems I work with, which I'll get into in a second, and, and sort of just my natural interest, I was always interested in what was happening within the black. And when we look at a lot of our landscapes in the south, this is a, an aerial photo of Eglin Air Force Base, which is, you know, 500 some thousand acres of longleaf. Burns are, are complete, and it's tough to tell here, but that is a completely burned forest right there. And you can start seeing some, some interesting patterns in overstory uh, tree canopy distribution, but that entire landscape burns. When they burn a 2,000 acre burn unit, it's 99.9% .9 black. So what's going on within the black? And that has been a kind of a, an area that has been almost unstudied in fire ecology. And you would think it would be where everybody would be naturally drawn, what, what happens in the areas that burns. But there were some serious limitations to collecting good data within the black that would allow you to make any kind of mechanistic observations. But fortunately, um, we're, we're working on in the 21st century and we have some new technology. So a big part of my research program over the last 10 years has been examining sources of variation and fire behavior and fire effects within the black. And here we see a, a typical Longleaf stand at Eglin Air Force Base, you know, a couple of minutes after the fire burned by and some of our instrumentation that we use within the fire, which I'll, I'll talk about right now. I must, have, I must have deleted that slide. We had some technical difficulties, so I, I had to delete those slides. So one of the, the critical innovations that we've been able to exploit is infrared thermal imagery, which allows us to collect spatially explicit and temporally explicit measurements of fire energy release. So in, in these tripods, um, which I won't tell you what the acronym is, but the tripods have a thermal imager mounted up top that allows us to collect very precise measurements of temperature or fire, fire heat flux over time. And at that scale, it's an optical system. So at that, at that uh, distance from our plots, we get a couple of millimeter scale resolution of, of fire energy release. And then we're also able to collect really detailed information on both fuel type, fuel structure, and plant demography, and then start looking at actual mechanisms that might explain some of what we see using the information that we collect from the thermal imagers. And these things started out being really expensive. They were a spin-off of military technology, but they're becoming less and less expensive. As a matter of fact, right now, there is a uh, version, a coarser scale version of this system that you can buy uh, and build your own little Raspberry Pi uh, thermal imager for probably around $250. Um, so the technology is becoming more and more available. And as it becomes more available, I think we'll start seeing some really rapid advances and some 
mechanistic links in fire ecology. So what have we done? So this question of why frequently burned longleaf pine ecosystems have the highest diversity uh, was, as I said, up until now, I think we have a pretty good idea of why fire and diversity are linked, but we didn't know until we started examining spatial patterns of fuels and fire energy release. And so what we've been able to do is by taking those detailed measurements of patterns of fuels and fire energy, we're able to then apply them to plant community assembly models, uh, sort of ecological um, theory on how plant communities build themselves. And so we've been testing this one particular model called the neutral model, and it seems to be really effective at explaining the actual reason why you get uh, fire energy, uh, why you get high diversity in frequently burned systems. And it has to do with fuel heterogeneity. It ties back to the, the um, ecology of fuels. So how does it tie back into the ecology of fuels? What we found is that variable fire intensity within stand, within the black, drives individual plant mortality at really fine scales. We're talking at the square uh, decimeter, so a couple of square inches. So that kind of variability is critical for opening up opportunities for recruitment. And so we've been doing some experiments where we actually have quanti we're quantifying the probability of mortality given different kinds of fuel that are derived from the overstory. And for example, here we see that pine cones are a really critical uh, driver of plant community dynamics in longleaf pine forests. And the reason is, is they burn a lot differently than the flashy fine fuels, which consume relatively quickly, release a fair amount of energy, but it's, it's very transient, not enough to really, maybe enough to top kill the organisms that live there, the plants, but not enough to actually cause mortality. But if you're unfortunate enough to have a pine cone land on you and you're a tiny little plant growing in the longleaf, and that's the other thing with longleaf, the plant diversity is at really fine scale, so we can talk a little bit more about that later. We're talking 50 different species per square meter. So the small scale variability in fire energy release is really important. So in this case, we showed that if a pine cone lands on your head, you've got about a three, three times greater probability of dying post-fire. And that's because of the, the greater amount of energy released by the cones. They burn hotter and they burn for a long period of time. And that allows the energy to do the work of destroying plant tissue, which ends up creating a little gap, a little tiny opportunity for um, recruitment. And so we've built a what's called a cellular automata model that uses this information, this mortality information, to then build a probabilistic model of what happens, who recruits into that gap. And so we see a schematic of that here. Let me try and use my, I'm gonna use the laser pointer. So right here we had a pine cone kill a plant, and these different colors represent different plant species that occupy the neighborhood. And what we can do is we can model the probability that a purple plant versus a yellow plant will occupy that site. And then we run simulations and we see if that matches empirical data that we've collected in the field. And so far, it works really well. No, sorry to interrupt. I'd recommend the, uh, the highlighter over the laser pointer. It might show up a little better. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I will do that in the future. Um, so that's all well and good uh, for pushing fire ecology as a science forward. So we're, we're really beginning to understand what the why is behind the link between frequent fire, plant, uh, uh, forest structure, the ecology of fuels, and explaining patterns of biodiversity. But how do we make that relevant to managers? And also, how do we make that relevant to other disturbances? I, in the intro, uh, I, I'm really interested in interactions among disturbances. So for example, interactions between a hurricane and forest structure and fire, you, you get some really complicated interactions. And, and we're, without mechanistic understanding of how fire behavior and fire effects are connected, we can't start looking at some of these more complex uh, issues. And you can, you can come up with your own scenarios of different interactions, but that's one that we're interested in. How, what happens when you alter the forest structure, so you're altering sort of the ecology of fuels by changing the distribution of overstory-derived fuels? I showed how pine cones are important, but 
pine needles are really important for, for fuel continuity and carrying fire across the landscape. So we need to be able to link these fine scale processes to coarser scale processes that are both relevant to management and also relevant to linking it to other kinds of disturbances. And so we've been able to do that uh, also using some newer technologies such as LIDAR where we're able to create very uh, precise three-dimensional maps of forest structure. We then derive fuel models, a different kind of fuel model uh, than you're probably used to thinking that's going to predict uh, distribution of fuels at very fine scales and, and, and kinds of fuels at very fine scales. So we basically map, create a map of fuels from a map of the overstory. And then we can run either fire simulations or just uh, actual burns through our landscape, measure fire intensity, and then run our, our CA model, our cellular automata model on biodiversity. So that's the way we can actually predict how changing the canopy of the forest is going to influence both fire behavior and then patterns of biological diversity on the landscape. So we're able to course in the scale of our investigations. And we've been, we've been working on this at, at Eglin Air Force Base in, in the panhandle of Florida where we've, we've actually we've been successful in creating a landscape model of canopy density. We've got stand level models of fuel patterns down to the square decimeter scale. And then we can run sort of these simulations that that will occur at the, the scale that is relevant to the individual plants. And we're work this is not ready for prime time yet, but we've got the components. We're working on linking them now. And so this is how we'll be able to actually convince the Eglin fire and timber managers that, that our work is useful. And so all this hinges, and I had a really sweet picture of a, of a pine forest in the Bahamas. I was just in the Bahamas doing some fire training. Uh, they have fire dependent pine forests in, in the Bahamas. They're actually the dominant upland community in the, in the big islands to the north. And what my work there has shown me is how critical pines are as a foundation species. And to define a foundation species, it's, a, it's kind of ecological jargon, but I think it's a really important concept. Most people have heard of keystone species, which is an organism like uh, a beaver, for example, that it it's, has a disproportionate impact on its environment based on its biomass. So the, the biomass of beavers across a, a northeastern landscape is relatively low, but they can have a really large impact by damming up creeks and creating ponds. So they're a keystone species. So you know they either have a disproportionate impact or a lot of other species depend on them. But a foundation species is a different concept. It's sort of like the species is the habitat. So in longleaf pine, without longleaf pine, you don't have a longleaf pine, all those 300, 400 species that, that exist. A single pine species that provides critical fuels is the foundation of the habitat. So it's a, it's a key component. And when you lose your foundation species, it's a catastrophe. And we're seeing this happening all over. I work in the Turks and Caicos as well, and, and an introduced scale insect virtually eliminated the pines there. And, and it's, a, it's a typical southern slash tropical pine ecosystem in that you have a monospecific overstory, single species of pine, no midstory, and then this really rich and diverse shrub and herbaceous layer. And in this particular habitat, the substrate is rock, so you don't have really good fuel continuity without pine needles. And now the pine needles are gone, so fire will no longer carry across the landscape because the trees are all dead. And so in a single event that occurred over about a 10-year period, the foundation species collapsed. All the other fire-dependent species that depend on the frequent fires that are carried by the needles are now threatened. And uh, it's a real conundrum as to what to do next. And so in, in the systems I work, these these pines are foundation species for two main reasons. Uh, one is that pine needles are a critical fuel because they provide continuity across areas which are vegetation free. And they, they, they interact with other fuels uh, to burn more intensely. And I had a, another slide where I, we did an experiment where we carefully removed the pine needles from a patch of wiregrass. And so 
we have a lot of folks in the in the southeast that believe that the wire grass is 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 the foundation species, but it turns out that especially in summer burns or late uh, spring burns, if you don't have pine needles mixed in with the wire grass, it actually won't burn, and we've actually demonstrated this experimentally. So they not only provide continuity, they interact with other fuels to create higher intensity patches of fire. And we're also just learning that, oh, there we go, never mind, I do have the picture. So here you see that experiment where we suspended a technician above the plot using saw horses and ladders so they wouldn't disturb the fuel structure and carefully had them pull out the in thousands of individual pine needles. And then we lit a prescribed fire in areas where the pine needles were removed did not burn, areas that were untreated did burn. And so you see that synergy in, in, that are derived from the pine needles in effect right there. But the other thing that we just learned is that, that the coarser fuels, the branches, the, the you know, even logs and, and cones are really critical for driving uh, plant community dynamics through their variation energy release. This is a thermal image of, of a longleaf that had just dropped its cones. And if you are familiar with longleaf, you know that they are what are called a masting species. So every, say, 10 or 15 years, all the trees in the forest drop their cones at the same time, and there's a long story as to why they likely do that. But you end up with this carpet of pine cones, so you could see how these periodic masting events could have a major influence on plant community dynamics through the tremendous amount of energy being released by those burning cones. And so to bring it back home to management um, and the ecology of fuels, if you follow this flow chart or this model, it's a, it's a um, sort of a conceptual model of, of of how forest structure and fire interact. And I'm going to use my, there we go. So by manipulating forest structure, because pines are a foundation species, you, you have this cascading effects of uh, changing the pattern and, and distribution of, of uh, fine fuels, which affects fire behavior, which affects fire effects, which then alters competition, which feeds back into forest structure. So it, it gives you a target. It, it allows the manager to think, okay, I don't have to worry about trying to manipulate fine fuels because how would you ever do that? You can manipulate fire behavior in the context of the fire fuels through your ignition patterns and, and, and other issues, but a really effective and easy way to affect all these other properties of a fire-dependent ecosystem is to influence the forest structure. So, you know, this may not be new and it may have been intuitive to a lot of folks, but we felt that this was a useful framework to start thinking about the link between forest structure, fuels, and fire behavior. And you learn a lot when you start making this link because there's often been a lot of arguments about how to manage longleaf pine forests silviculturally. And so various Treatments have been proposed and, you know, group selection of X size, single tree selection, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at how the forest actually functions in the context of the ecology of fuels, you see that gap size or the trees that you take out aren't as important as the trees that you leave because you need to have that continuity of pine fuels to prevent the recruitment of, of oaks and other palmettos, et cetera. So when you alter your selection process and you change gap size, you're going to have a big influence on how the, the next fire is going to burn through that stand. So if your gap is too big and you create a discontinuous fuel bed, you end up with the oaks that are always present in the understory of the longleaf being released and they create sort of their own new kind of fuel, this mosaic of a different kind of fuel that is less likely to burn and so they tend to persist. That may be a desirable outcome you may want to increase habitat heterogeneity and include some stands of oak as little oak domes within your landscape. Or if you're you know, interested in regenerating longleaf, you don't want that to happen. So this understanding of how the overstory affects the fuel distribution and the fire behavior is critical for determining the outcome of your, your intervention. So you know, this is a photograph of what happens with a gap that's just a little too big to allow fire to carry through it and subsequent fires, and then you see the oaks have been released. You're not getting pine regeneration there. 
you're getting oak regeneration. So this is sort of a critical concept to understand if you're going to be a, fire, uh, a timber manager in a fire dependent ecosystem. You have to start thinking about fuels and you have to start thinking about what you're leaving behind as much as what you're taking out. And finally, let's take it home. So I've given examples uh, from longleaf pine and, and it applies to uh, other southern ecosystems and tropical ecosystem, Caribbean pine. Uh, but how do we generalize? How can we use this concept to generalize? And, I, and actually, we'll leave it up to you in the question and answer section. But, and I didn't touch on how fuels actually influence fire atmosphere dynamics and, and how fire burns across the landscape, but, uh, you know, we can talk about that as well. But one thing I've noticed in all my travels is that and, and as an ecologist, this, this kind of rings a bell, is that when you see similar forest structure, and they're completely different species, so here's that sweet picture of the Bahamas. This is Caribbean pine growing over limestone in the Bahamas. It's in the native, uh, you know, endemic pine of the Bahamas. You notice the monospecific overstory, very little midstory, and, and then a rich understory. This is Honduras. You see a similar pattern. Uh, this is a, a different species of Caribbean, a subspecies of Caribbean pine. This is Cuba. They have similar ecosystems. All the taxa that we're looking at here are completely different, but the structure and likely the function is the same. And you can travel around the world. There's, a, there's, there's pine forests in Southeast Asia that have the similar structure. There's even forests, not very many of them left now, but in, in South America with a different kind of conifer but it has the same structure and likely a similar function. And when you get to really exotic locales like New Jersey, uh, it looks to me like you might have some kinds of similar processes happening here. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with the, the, the ecology of, of some of the Northeastern fire dependent ecosystems, but I would be willing to bet that if you started looking and thinking about the ecology of fuels in, in the context of your system, you might be able to come up with some really interesting new, new angles to it. Um, and that's where I'm going to end, and that'll give us some time for some questions, and, and uh, I'd love to hear from people. Well, great. Thank you so much, Joe. That was a really, really fascinating presentation. Oh, thank um, you. I'll just, yeah. Oh, this is exciting. So I'll just remind folks that are, uh, that are online um, that uh, a PDF copy with some of the cool photos and graphics uh, from Joe's presentation are available on the NAFTI website, uh, firesciencenorthatlantic.org slash s slash ecology dash of dash fuels dash NFE dot PDF. But if you go to the basically the web page for uh, Dr. O'Brien's presentation, um, you'll see a link there that says PDF, and I put a copy into the chat box as well. So speaking of the chat box, we had a couple questions come in. Um, for now, I'm going to encourage folks to type questions into the chat box, but we might have time at the end to open up the floor um, and unmute the participant line. So I'll start by uh, addressing, asking the first question in the chat box. Uh, Bob Cremens asks, Joe, from your study, do you have a dose-response relationship for mortality? I guess it would be particular to species, et cetera. That's an awesome question. Yeah, uh, we're working on that. Right now, we're, we've just developed a, um, it's, it's basically just a probabilistic model. Um, but one of the things we're looking at is we're starting to look at individual species and their, and their sort of structural characteristics, the size of the plant and its below ground regenerative organs and see, I'm sure there's a dose dependent relationship. We tried to keep it simple initially because one of the beauties of the neutral model is that it's, it's, it's kind of a null hypothesis and, and you don't need any species characteristics. You basically just need a probability of mortality. But that's definitely, the, the, you know, that's something we should look at, and I'm sure there is, and that adds another sort of level of the complexity of, of the community assembly. But, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll, I'll uh, skip Susan's question for a moment because Bob was continuing. So to produce a totally mechanistic model linking forest structure, disturbances, change in forest structure, it seems like it is possible to do, at least statistically, he says. Yeah, 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 and, and you know, the other interesting thing is, is um, with these models, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, when they, when they run a model, they expect to, like, they run the model and they say, okay, this is what's going to happen. But what we do with our models is we look at, we run the model, say, 1,000 times or 10,000 times, and we develop these probability distributions of what is likely happening. So, 
you know, the, you're not going to be able to run the model and say, oh, okay, I'm going to expect this pattern of species here. But what we can do is say, if you alter the structure of the forest this way, it's likely to result either in an increase or a decrease in diversity or this kind of pattern of regeneration. But yeah, that's the goal. The goal is ultimately to have a, a, a more or less mechanistic model that we can then deal with some of the uncertainties that climate change is going to introduce, uh, invasive species and all these other things. Because if you build a statistical model, you're basically assuming that whatever the pattern that you use to build your statistical model is continuing into the present and the future. But we would like to move more mechanistic, which can handle uncertainty a little bit better. But we'll, I'm sure we'll be hitting up Bob in retirement <laughs> for some help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you ought, to, uh, you ought to go for a woods walk with Bob at some point. Yeah. Um, all right. So we had another question that came in from Susan Buckley. And again, folks on the line, feel free to, uh, to type questions into the chat box so we can continue. Um, so Susan asks, I know you said you weren't going to get into the weather, but I have to ask, um, our age levels play a part as to when and how you conduct the, you conducted the burn, not just for safety, but to apply stress to the plants to, to promote destruction, with a question mark. We have an issue in the plains with woody invasives and would like to fine tune the use of fire to remove them. That's, yeah. You know, and, and um, unfortunately, most of our, our experiments are constrained by prescriptions, right? So um, unless you can get a, a sort of a broader prescription for an experiment where, you know, you're pushing the envelope, uh, you would expect there to be a lot different kind of fire behavior and energy release in a wildfire than you would in a prescribed fire because of exactly what, what she said. That's very true. We're seeing that in North Georgia right now where we have a bunch of wildfires burning and it's bone dry and it's having much different uh, fire behavior and likely fire effects than, than a typical prescribed burn up there. But that's, you know, that's a whole other area that I think is really interesting. We've been looking at this concept of sort of alternative stable states and how do you, how do you get back from an alternative stable state? And what that means is in a grassland, for example, when you take fire away for a period of time, all of a sudden you get these woody plant encroachments, but then they create sort of conditions that perpetuate themselves and it's hard to go back to a grassland without really sort of in, you know, expensive or, you know, or intensive management interventions. And so that's an area that we're looking at. Um, how, how can you use fire to sort of move systems from one alternative stable state to another? But that's, you know, that is clearly understanding the physiology of, of fire damage is, is critical. And if you can really whack them um, with a hot fire, which probably won't have much influence at all on, on some of your grasses and forbs, but a larger influence on the, on the woody stuff, I, you know, that's something to experiment with. Um, you know, we're working on some physiological models of fire damage in, in sweet gum, which is an, an undesirable species that is coming into the Piedmont. So uh, I would, you know, that's something that just as a fire manager, start, start pushing your envelope a little bit um, and maybe trying to burn hotter, drier, and see what happens. All right, more uh, conversations going on than I can keep up with. So Susan added to that, uh, we are burning on BIA lands, which has helped get around restrictions. Flint Hills burns January to uh, PWX day and has issues with burning outside of those days. Uh -huh. um, very frustrating to try other times of year. And she also adds tax day, April 15th. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, the constraints are, are kind of like frustrating uh, at times, but, um, you know, me, even, even within that time period, you know, maybe use variability and, and seasonal variability year to year to maybe you can, you know, you start really paying close attention to your temperatures and relative humidity and the phenology of the plants. If they break bud a little earlier, maybe hit them with a fire or, you know, just you have to work with, within your constraints, but try and appreciate the variability that exists and, and maybe exploit it in, in some of your management experiments. That's, you know, it's, it sounds like a really interesting place to work. Yeah, and uh, and our February webinar, Jack McGowan Stinsky from the Lake States is going to address the seasonality of fire. Um, so that will be another good webinar to catch that might delve into this a little further. Um, Bob Kerman's had a couple more PSs. So he says, if the model was relevant, then running it a bunch, of, a bunch will give uncertainties in going from one state to another. For example, the number of ways a point can go from one state to another. Right. And one of the things... I think like doing repetitive model runs too can, can start, you can use it as sort of sensitivity analysis. So you can start tweaking parameters and see whether the model 
outcomes become unstable and and you know which ones they are or if it always converges regardless of whether you alter one of the other variables i think that's that's sort of what and and i'm not the modeler <laughs> uh <laughs> but um you know i think that's why we're we're using it and plus you know inherently the um the neutral model is probabilistic so we do have to run it many times to get to get a good distribution yeah, and Bob also adds humidity can be added to the model seasonally on daily averages. The NOAA boys, of course, have this data. Um, that might be another PS. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to, when we get to that point, we will do that. And I'm sure, you know, when I'm fishing with Bob, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So you have an invitation to come up to New Jersey. Ken Clark um, says, oh, great. Joe, first of all, he says, Joe, first of all, we would like to invite you to the New Jersey Pine Barren. Oh, My question excellent. is, <laughs> so come on up. Uh, are, there, are, there other, are there other factors that influence fuels on the forest floor in longwood pine systems, especially pocket gophers, beetles, or gopher tortoises? Would you consider incorporating these in your model in the future? Yeah, that's, you know, and, and the pocket gopher uh, actually let us down. A, we call it the, the million dollar sort of uh, pocket gopher mound. Um, the pocket gophers introduce fuel free patches that allowed us to observe some patterns of fuel and fire behavior that have led to a big CERTIP grant that uh, Rod Lynn from Los Alamos and um, my colleague Scott Goodrick, who's a meteorologist, and myself, and, and sort of how this fire atmosphere coupling is influenced by patches of both different kinds of fuel and fuel-free zones. And so, yes, that is, that's a great idea. Right now, we're just trying to get a handle on plant community dynamics before we introduce the um, the sort of fire behavior element, but that is, that's, the, you know, fuel free patches are just as relevant as fuel patches in, in determining fire behavior and fire effects. So that's a great observation. Excellent, thank you. So I'm sure people are typing furiously. No. Uh, we'll, give folks, <laughs> we'll, we'll give folks another moment to, uh, to, to type their questions into the chat box. Um, I'm sure that there's more discussion to be had. Um, do you have any other thoughts or comments you wanted to add while we're uh, waiting for folks to finish their questions? Uh, no, you know, just um, you know, basically, I think we've we've gotten a lot of this insight just because we started paying attention to within fire variability, and 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 I would embrace I would I would tell everyone to embrace technology and start if you're a fire ecologist, don't use paint plates, don't you know, use thermocouples to measure soil temperature, but don't try and create. Uh, two or three dimensional maps of, of fire and energy release using thermocouples. Learn how to use and, and try and get a hold of some of this new technology and, and I think you'll find it really useful for a lot of different kinds of studies. Cool, thanks. Yeah. So, let's see. I'll give folks another few seconds and see if they want to type sure. questions in. Um, otherwise, I, I will probably open up the phone lines. Um, so, so, I'll ask when we open up the phone lines, um, Okay, so oh, Bob Kremens had a little PS. He says, I can help with some of the technology applications, which indeed is true. Yes, so. <laughs> yeah, Bob is our go-to for technology. Yeah, all right. Um, so I think unless I see another question pop into the chat box in the next minute or two, um, I'd like to open up the phone line. So what I'm gonna ask is that, oh, oh, Bob has another, no wait, sorry, Joe Vaughn has another. He says, can you speak to the effects of pyrogenic oaks as compared to off-site oaks for carrying fire? Absolutely. We've actually started doing a lot of work uh, and in longleaf sand hills, the really xeric sites that we've been working in, the, the pyric oaks, the turkey oaks and, and the red oaks, actually, you know, it's, it's a, they're a functional analog to pines in that their, their leaves carry fire just as well as pine needles. Now contrast those to the non-pyrogenic oaks like uh, live oak or sand live oak, which actually under, unless it's the most extreme conditions, they just, it's like a, a asbestos, they call it the asbestos forest. So yes, the, and, and that comes down to likely the, the structure of the leaf itself, the, the mass of the leaf, per, the specific mass of, of the leaf and, and its airiness, like the uh, red oaks kind of crinkle up and, and they have a lot of surface area and a lot of edges. The live oaks kind of lay flat and they form this kind of mat that holds soil moisture in and they, and they tend to have much higher uh, fuel moisture and they tend to dry out a lot slower. So yes, that oaks are a critical component. They're another foundation species. They've been 
denigrated in the longleaf system, and, and we've 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 lately started to champion the role of oak as as a really critical component of of fire dependent longleaf ecosystems. And it's probably true wherever you get those kind of white and red oaks with those highly burnable leaves. Wow, great. Um, we have Joe another moment if he wants to add on to his question. Um, and also anybody else who wants to enter a question into the chat box. Um, if we don't get another question pretty soon, I'm going to try to open up the phone line. And what I'm going to do is uh, ask everybody to mute your individual phone, if you can. Um, and some, some people will use press star six. Some people have a mute button or tick button on your smartphone or whatever you might have. Um, and uh, and then we'll, we'll let people ask questions on the phone line. Uh, Joel Carlson says, great job, thanks. Hey, Joel, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So I'm going to um I'm going to unmute the phone lines and we'll see if we don't have too bad background noise we can let folks ask other questions. So okay. here we go un unmuting the phone lines. All right. Everybody there? I'm still here. You still there, Joe? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh boy. Oh okay, we have another question that popped into the chat box. Um so I will remute just temporarily. Okay. So David Goodwin says, what are your thoughts about the role of herbivores in these savanna systems? Almost all of these southeast systems, um, large herbivores have been extirpated, but there's evidence in other savanna systems suggesting that these critters can or could, if returned, play a role in the ecology of savanna fuel systems. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. And, and I think, so I don't think of longleaf as a savanna, first of all. I, I think of it as a woodland or a forest. I think when you have, when you look at the distribution of tree densities, you, you go from very high density down to very sparse. And at the savanna end, like, you know, um, sort of when you're starting to grade into prairies, I think that's a really excellent observation. I think that herbivores largely could have provided the sort of mortality analog that pine cones do. So their hoof prints or their wallows or you know what depending on the, the kind of herbivore could have actually created this mosaic of mortality that's critical for maintaining high species diversity if you think about how species diversity is maintained if you've got a bunch of rare species and a bunch of other species eventually competition is going to eliminate the rarer species and you don't see that in, in these frequently disturbed systems and that's where this whole neutral model theory came from. And so if you're more common, you have a higher probability of dying, but you're also opening up another opportunity for a rare plant to recruit. And you can model this. So it would be really neat to sort of model herbivore hoof print mortality or herbivore, you know, however they eat or, or dust themselves or whatever, and see if you could create a sort of spatial model of plant community dynamics that, you know, interacted with fire and herbivores. So let's do it. Uh, especially in those prairie ecosystems, which don't have the sort of, you don't have the fuel heterogeneity introduced by, by trees, but something else is going on. So that could be the answer right there. Nice. Yeah, Bob Cummins uh, added, he says, in a more natural ecosystem like Africa, the fire folks separate herbivores into browsers and foragers, and there is different uh, fire effects based on the percentages of each type. Yeah, so then, you know, you're, you're adding new elements of, of um, sort of you're, you're layering disturbances on top of disturbances, which is really fascinating to me. And of course, I'd like to work in Africa, enjoy it there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a really good point. And, and, you know, that adds another, like, you know, some people call, there's been people who use fire as a browser or a herbivore analog. It's not quite the same, but there's actually a paper where somebody uh, proposed that fire was basically just a big herbivore. But fire is not as selective as real herbivores. And so if you've got browsers versus grazers, clearly that's going to have a, a really interesting dynamic with when it interacts with fire. Nice. And yeah, David Gooden says, great, thanks. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I got to ask another question. Sure. Southern pine beetle. So okay. Southern pine beetle is uh, starting to make its way into the southern part of our region. Um, what are some thoughts that we should be uh, thinking about in terms of uh, ecology, changes to ecology, and fire behavior and fire effects. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, not knowing sort of the role that the overstory plays in your fire behavior dynamics, but it certainly plays a role in, in competition with understory and grasses and whatnot. Um, 
you know, we have southern pine beetles are endemic down here, and you know, we have outbreaks that kind of are linked to droughts. And the way the Forest Service treats them down here is basically, um, you know, they'll they'll protect, they'll clear out areas of of um, infested trees and then replant those areas and then protect those areas until the saplings are are big enough to be fire resistant. But what that does to the landscape is, is yes, it creates this new dynamic that, especially if it if it hasn't happened in the past, it's hard to know what's going to, you know, how it's going to influence your fire. But you have an increase in heavies, you have a decrease in fine fuels, at least in our systems, and that is a major influence on prescribed fire, but it's also a major influence if there's a wildfire, like we have right now, where you're getting 10,000 hour fuels consuming the white ash, which is would never happen in a prescribed fire. So I would look to, you know, think about the ecology of fuels, you know, like understand what role the, the it's pitch pine that's getting attacked, correct? Yes. Yeah, so what, what role does the pitch pine have as a live tree versus a dead tree in, in the context of, of the ecology of fuels? But, you know, I, I, I'm expecting that, is it a legacy of warmer winters or, or um, I don't know, maybe it's uh, overstocking of stands. I, I don't know, why are you getting the new pine beetle outbreaks? It's a very good question. I, I suspect the answer might be, again, in kind of that link between forest structure uh, and some other things. Of course, okay. there's, never, you know, there's never one uh, straight sure. answer. Right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're in, you know, we're in this era, you know, it's been called the no analog future, where we're, we're seeing changes that haven't, that we haven't seen in the past, and so it's hard to know exactly how to respond to them if you have no, you know, historical reference to, to go by. So it's the brave new world of forest management that we're living in. So, uh, but, you know, I would just fall back on sort of this ecology of fuel concept, which could be a good place to start. All right. Um, so Bob Kremens adds, um, there is a serum cloud around the beetles, I think. Uh, so stand density, then oh, bug. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think down here it's it's like you said that the the beetles attack stressed trees, and so it's almost like they're the living dead anyways, and the beetles are opportunistic, and and they're not the actual cause of the death. They're sort of the the coup de gras, but um, and I know that that's true. And the way they treat them is they hit the spot, they clear cut the spot, and then they clear cut a ring of trees around the spot that are likely to also infect it, and that's sort of their their tactic with treating bug spots before they become a full-blown sort of forest-wide outbreak. Yeah, um, Kathy Schwager just wrote in from Long Island. She says overstocking is a huge contributor to the southern pine beetle issue on Long Island. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, and this might be one of those things where you're looking at a, a change in state. I see that Ken Clark talked about oaks sort of replacing pines, and, and, and that can be one of these sort of shifts between one ecosystem state and another that, you know, it's hard to go back once it happens. So it might be, you know, you, and what we found is you have to act fast when these things are, are occurring. The longer you wait, the harder it is to get the system back to the state you want it in. Yeah, yeah, what are we restoring to? Right, <laughs> a exactly. good question. Right. Yeah, just to, to read Ken's Clark, uh, Ken Clark's comment for the record, he says, Joe, both of those factors are influencing southern pine beetle. Overstory oaks in the uplands and other hardwoods in the lowlands are being favored. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's getting complicated. And that's the exact same thing that's happening in that area in the Caribbean that I was talking about. The broadleaf species are basically released once the pines die because there's no more fire. And so once those hardwoods establish a canopy and, and create their own really non-flammable fuel bed. There's really no way to get the system back to pines unless you basically bulldoze it. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's these tipping points and it's jargon, but it's real. You know, like alternative stable states and tipping points, it's happening everywhere. It's happening in the southern Appalachians with the um, uh, hemlock woolly adelgia just sort of shifting these cove forests from one state to another. So, yikes. Yeah. I know. Um, so I also, uh, real quick, Susan Buckley had another follow-up to the, the herbivore discussion. She says cattle would also impact the landscape differently than wild animals, which we see in the Flint Hills. Dr. Briggs of Conza Prairie, KSU partner, has a new paper out on the impact of fuels with grazing animals. Oh, neat. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it because that's that's really interesting to me. I hadn't even, 
you know, I've been so focused on the, the, the overstory, understory connection that, you know, you tend to forget about our landscape is a lot different than it was 10,000 years ago, which also feeds into the sort of new paradigm that we're working in, and, and that's we're never going to restore something to its historical state anymore. We've got 400 ppm in the atmosphere, invasive species, certain important species are gone, chestnuts, now we have, you know, we've lost the, the red bays. So we're shifting towards this more management by objective and, and sort of forgetting about what's necessarily natural or unnatural, but how do you maintain maximal ecosystem function and, and not lose biodiversity? So, you know, if, if cows can be an analog some way, if carefully managed for bison or, or the extinct megafauna, then, you know, we have to start thinking about that instead of, you know, sort of wringing our hands about what happened in, in the distant past. But, you know, it's still somewhat controversial, that idea. Cool. Yeah. So I see we're actually two minutes after the hour, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so so anybody who needs to leave, uh, don't feel, uh, you know, yeah, don't you, feel you don't like want to miss that other webinar. <laughs> the Lake States, they record their webinars too. So okay. Um, so anybody who wants to stick around, uh, Joe, I don't know if you have you know, a few more minutes. I'm, to yeah, I'm, more yeah, I'm good until about 2.30. All right. Yeah. So if anybody has questions um, and you want to type them in uh, into the chat box, go ahead. Um, anybody else who needs to take off, go ahead. Um, or if you'd like me to open up the phone line so you can talk on the phone uh, directly with Joe, then uh, I'm happy to do that as well. Just type it into the chat box so I can see. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. O'Brien, for, for giving this webinar on the ecology of fuels today. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. It was, it was fun. It's my first webinar. <laughs> Amazing. You did a great job. Um, so we're having a few thank yous, and Susan Buckley is requesting that we open the phone line, so I'm going to unmute. Okay, we're unmuted now. So, Susan, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, it's more just for Joe. Um, I'm looking at what to do with PhD um, work here in the future, and what you're doing is a lot of what I would like to do, and I'm just kind of trying to figure out how to get to you, I guess, is a way to say that, or trying to get to someone who does similar research that you would do. I'm, I'm about 12 months out from done with my master's. Okay. And uh, it, it's a drive for me to finish the PhD, but I just, there's no forestry here in Kansas. And right. We're, we're here because my husband's military and we had to be here. It was one of the few places that would teach agronomy at the same time as somewhere for my husband to work. Uh-huh. But uh, he's about to retire, and I get to have the freedom. And I'm like, hmm, where do I go next? <laughs> well, you know, um, we're 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 starting this um, prescribed fire consortium that's sort of centered out of tall timbers, and you know that there's going to be sort of we're going to treat tall timbers sort of as like this playground uh, for research and um, and investigations into stuff like the ecology of fuels and, and other things. The southeast is a great place to do this kind of stuff because we do so much burning. There's not that danger of writing a experimental fire into your dissertation and not having it get done. Um, you know, working in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, you know, any place in the southeast, it's almost a guarantee that you will get your, your experimental fires done. Um, I am faculty at the University of Georgia. We could look into, you know, of course it's always about funding, right? But um, we could look into, if you write me, uh, we can look into what the possibilities might be if you were going to come here. I can be a, an advisor. There's other people in my, in my uh, work unit here that, that would be good, and, and also lots of folks that I collaborate with um, that are interested in, in different aspects of, of what I talked about today. So, yeah, there's definitely opportunity, and there's definitely a need for more fire scientists. Uh, there's really... It's kind of one of the few fields in ecology, I think, that is underpopulated. So I would awesome. totally recommend that you pursue your goal. <laughs> I, I think I'll be unique because my master's will be in the agronomy and most in grasses sure. uh, and rangeland work. But I, I'm secretly a forester at heart. And so when I walk through the building, they kind of look at me like, ew, you forester, go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, the nice thing about the longleaf is there's a lot of grass, too. So. <laughs> You got your trees yeah. and your grass, so it would be, uh, be a natural sort of extension for, for your skill set. Yeah, we lived at uh, Fort Bragg for seven years. Okay. Uh, I'm really familiar with the longleaf pines yep. and headed cock headed woodpeckers. <laughs> yep. yep, that's right. Yep, the RCW. <laughs> I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, 
So your research is looking at uh, how vegetation affects the fuels. Did you do any research on night burning? I've been no, but several night uh, burns, and it seems to be a, a yeah. quite a different burn pattern and burn intensity. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the issues with our prescriptions down here is that normally we have to have the fire's got to be out by 5 p.m. because of air quality issues and, and also smoke on highways sort of concerns. But that said, when I was working in the Bahamas, we did experiment with some nighttime burn. We have virtually no constraints there. Um, but you're right. Uh, and, and, you know, if you think about the variability in fire behavior that you get when you're limited to burning between 20% RH and 50% RH, winds only 10 miles an hour, but greater than 10 to less than 20, and fire's got to be out by noon, you're missing a, a whole sort of suite of variability that you would get from burning at night. You'd also, you were also missing the higher intensity um, sort of impacts that you get from burning when it's really dry and really windy, which it would have, you know, you, you would get different impacts. But yeah, that's a great observation. And, and it's always exciting when you can get involved with the night burn because you, it totally, it's totally different. I don't know if you are able to experiment up in the Northeast with night burning, but um, I'm actually down here in Florida. I'm in Northeast Florida, but oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's parts of North Florida where you can you get exceptions to be able to burn at night. I think yeah, right? there's a couple, and there's a fairly big area in South Florida that's still allowed night burning. Yeah, so yeah, I, I you know it's not something that I have measured. I've observed it, but I think it's a you know it's a critical element of the diversity in in getting good fire effects. You know, one of the things that we've learned is you don't ever want to eliminate any kind of aspect of fire, high intensity, low intensity, burn all year round. You know, the, the current state of knowledge is not so great that we can definitively say that you should burn this way at this time. And so you want to keep all that variability in your pocket and, and observe as a manager what your, you know, what, what the fire did for you. Do you think there was uh, as much uh, intensity in burning, you know, historically, if, uh, you know, if our ecosystems were burning on a one to three to five year rotation, it would have seemed like we would have had much less fuel loading than we have now? Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, you know, there are still places where we get that kind of, you know, as you know, uh, that we get that kind of fire return interval. But definitely two things happen when you start lengthening the fire return interval one is you release the the hardwoods and so you you not you get this period where you get higher fire potential higher fire intensity but then you also get this sort of diminishing over time as as the fuel bed changes at least up here in the piedmont especially you start moving into more music hardwood species and and it's it gets actually pretty difficult to burn but yeah yeah i i think frequency is is your friend we've shown and not myself, but lots of other people have shown that frequency and high biodiversity are, are pretty tightly linked. And high frequency gives you a lot more sort of control over your landscape. Um, but yes, you do lose that sort of high intensity end that you might see in patches throughout the landscape if they somehow escape fire and then they did burn. Right. So yeah, yeah, I think that's it's all important. <laughs> that's not a very satisfying answer, but. It, <laughs> <laughs> oh no no I think you address address the point and we do see that here uh if you you know allow your uh, uh, offsite oaks your water oaks and laurel oaks and sand live oaks to take over yeah uh, after <clears throat> once they start shading out the, the ground cover and, and smothering the leaf litter you you almost can't burn it yep yep yeah wonderful this yeah, awesome yeah. thanks for thanks for the question. All right. Um, you have uh, another invitation to come up to see the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Oh, that, I really, you know, I need to. I'm a, I'm originally from Western New York, so I've been and I've been to New Jersey a bunch of times, but uh, you know, I just I don't know anything about it. Sorry, <laughs> but I will. Find out. I'm going to take up your invitations. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So yeah, I sent you the participant list. Uh, John okay. Donnell is in there. Um, yeah. So other folks on the phone line have questions. Wore out their ear. Don't be shy. <laughs> and then you have my contact info in case people want to get in touch with me as well. Yeah, yeah, and of course you're on the on the Southern Research Station website, so it's pretty easy to to find your contact info. Okay, good. Okay. I was I was up on the bathroom in the in the in the building here. 
<laughs> Good, glad to have you back, Bob. <laughs> How you doing? You wash your hands. <laughs> Good. Number was up there, you know, for a good time called Joe O'Brien. Yeah. <laughs> this webinar is being recorded. Yes. <laughs> oh, so, uh, Bob, how's it going with the uh, Raspberry Pis? Good. We have a, a box uh, with two cameras and a switch, so you can have one camera or two cameras. Cool. Visible and in, in, uh, infrared. Yep. And then uh, just getting some boxes together to... Uh, you know, with a shield, I'm gonna. I've been fooling around with uh, just in my backyard with uh, just just a single heat shield. Uh huh. Seems to be a really good uh, spaced out about three eighths of an inch, just a single piece of sheet metal. Uh, so it's durable. You don't have to fool with it. And uh, these are looking down, so you know you just need it on one side and around the corners a little bit. So it seems, it seems like it works pretty good in keeping the temperatures inside the box down. Cool. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, yeah, Joel's. Yeah, we've been. He's been fooling around too, and um, yeah. uh, it, you know, basically working off your design. So it'll be interesting to see what we all come up with. It's, but yeah, I mean, we need them. Uh, we need lots of these things. Get well, these things uh, out there, you know. I'm, I'm going to build like 35 boxes, and we have enough parts for 20. Uh, Matt has 15. He had some money from the end of the year, so he bought 15. Raspberry Pis, 15 flares, and 15 uh, visible cameras. Okay. And then, uh, you know, four or five from you, five or six maybe. I don't know how many. We got we got enough money to build quite a few. And I, I think I think we got about I think we're looking at about 10 or 12 here too. So we'll have a nice little array. Yeah. Pods. And um, you know they do have different fields of view on a different. They have different setups for different fields of view. Right. Uh, right. So you know depending on what height you want to place, what resolution you need. Sure. Uh, just swap the sensor out. I mean, it's really, it really doesn't, doesn't. Yeah, that's not. right. It just plugs in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but if we have any other questions, because I know you guys could go on for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. no problem. No, no problem. No problem. Um, so anybody else out there have uh, have questions for Dr. O'Brien while we still have him on the line? You guys have each other's phone numbers, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll touch base. Yes. Yeah. This is easy, though, you know. Don't have to dial. <laughs> Other questions from folks on the phone line? I know we have a few people still out there. Okay. Well, I think we can uh, officially wrap up the webinar. Um, okay. Thanks, think, Amanda. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a blast, and uh, I got I'm glad I got some contacts in the Pine Barrens now, so that'll be that'll be fun. Yeah, definitely. And you should check out our website if you want to find out about, you know, field trips and other uh, really cool events that are happening. So do. Will do. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks so much for, for the webinar. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you on the next one. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And uh, ciao. <laughs> All right. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.